Thank you, uh, Dr. Bassam. Very nicely, uh, you know, elaborated through the trials of the um, diabetes and, and heart failure. So we'll have a question at the end of the session. Now um, we'll introduce um, Dr. Mohammed Shimri, who is the head of the cardiology unit in Al Jahra Hospital, as well as interventional cardiologist at the Chest Diseases Hospital. He's going to go over the modern lipid management, new goals, and new tools. Until we have the um, slides slide ready, um, I don't know, Dr. Bassam, if you agree um, with us. Nowadays, probably the cardiologists are yeah. using the um, SGLT2 uh, inhibitor way more than the diabetologists. It is class one. Um, you know, do you foresee, you know, in the future there will be a subspeciality as, you know, we are in the era of sub, sub, sub specialities nowadays that, you know, the, uh, you know, cardio metabolic or, you know, cardio endocrinologists will be in charge of that. Um, we'll have this probably answered in the session since we have it, so just bear in mind. Okay, good morning everybody, thanks for attending. Uh, special thanks to the organizing committee for the kind invitation. My name is Dr. Mohammed Al Shammari. I'm a consultant cardiologist in the Al Jahra Hospital. And I'll be talking today about modern lipid management, new goals and new tools. Just to Put things into context, we all know that cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer. It's the leading cause of mortality globally. Um, it accounts for almost one third of all deaths worldwide. And it has increased more than 12% in the decade between 2005 and 2015. And it continues to increase. It's expected to rise to more than 24 millions by the year 2030. More than 80% of cardiovascular deaths is attributed to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, mainly heart attacks and stroke, and it, it remains the most predominant cause of death from non-communicable diseases. Uh, most cases of cardiovascular disease uh, are attributable to non-modifiable and potentially modifiable uh, risk factors. The non-modifiable, we all know them, old age, ethnicity, gender, family history, and FH. The modifiable ones include the behavioral tobacco use, high alcohol consumption, unhealthy diet, low physical activity, metabolic syndrome with hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, abdominal obesity, in addition to the other uh, newly added risk factors, CKD, inflammatory disease, and psychosocial status. Today I'll be talking mainly about the hypercholesterolemia, because we know that elevated LDL is the major risk factor for the development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Looking at the risk patterns uh, for subsequent cardiovascular event over a range of LDLC values for a given value, um, uh, if, you, if you, look, you have to look at the overall risk of the patient. If you combine it with other risk factors like diabetes, coronary heart disease, or metabolic syndrome, you see the risk there is increasing exponentially from about 10 to up to 70% of cardiovascular event rates for any given uh, mixture of risk factors. Looking at the global picture, so the, the World Health Organization has divided the, the, the member countries of the ESC into countries with low risk, moderate risk, high risk, or very high risk populations for cardiovascular mortality. Our country is not in the in the, in the chart there, but we are all surrounded by red countries, very high risk. Uh, our data is lacking in recent years. I only could find slightly older data. This is uh, from the Kuwait Institute for the Health Metrics and Evaluation, uh, looking at the m m 10 uh, major causes of total number of death in 2019. Ischemic heart disease was number one, and 10 years later continued to be number one with an increase of almost 40%. In addition, stroke, which is another atherosclerotic cardiovascular manifestation, is the second cause. Here, looking at the risk of premature death, 
due to non-communicable diseases overall, it is trending down over the years. However, if you look at the proportional mortality, cardiovascular disease in Kuwait is, accounts for just over 40%. And this is much higher than the global average of about one third. They looked at the healthcare system, uh, trying to ascertain the reason for that increase. And they found that in terms of the essential medications and technologies, we score almost full mark, so everything is almost available. And looking at the guideline and the proportion of the primary health care, uh, we, we, we are in par with the, with the global, uh, uh, global trend. Again, looking, this, this is a very common slide. Most of us have seen it many times before. The reason I put it there is that it's a long process. Atherosclerosis is a long process. The mainstay or the triggering point is the cholesterol deposition into the arterial wall rather than just the serum levels of LDL. And you can interfere at any stage of that process. It's a very long and slow process. Looking at the timeline, the heart damage or the cardiovascular event is usually where we see most of our cases, but this is usually too late and the heart damage has already been there. And we, what we should aim is to uh, prevent these uh, events by treating these patients up almost seven to 10 years prior to having their first uh, event. A, a favorite publication of mine is the World Health Federation, the roadmap for cholesterol, which was updated last year. Um, and and, and they, they, they tried to change the narrative completely regarding the cholesterol management. They, they advocated that healthcare systems should focus on preserving health rather than just treating disease. And, and we should focus on the lifetime risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular death at any given age rather than just uh, using, uh, 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 using scores, uh, risk scores that, that only look at five or 10 years risk. So they estimated uh, that for the year 2019, almost four and a half million people died uh, almost with a direct cause of, uh, of, of the high non-HDL cholesterol. And globally, if you look at the upper normal level of uh, total cholesterol of five, almost 40% of adults uh, worldwide are above that. So this is the eight pillars, which is the fundamental messages from the roadmap for cholesterol. Atherosclerosis results from the retention of ABP proteins, mainly LDL cholesterol, uh, with cumulative effects over the lifespan of, uh, of a patient. It is a multifactorial disease. When, once you have deposition or once the process starts at, at a very age, at a very young age, if you combine it with other risk factors like smoking, diabetes, hypertension, the process is much faster. Uh, however, it's very important to notice that most of the events occur among individuals who don't have extreme elevations in the LDL cholesterol, and this is why you have to risk stratify your patient at any given state of, uh, stage of the treatment. FH is much more common than we think, and we should actively look for it by screening. Uh, atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease can be reduced by LDL cholesterol lowering uh, therapies. We have the oral tablets and now we have the injectables that they all work through different pathways and the benefit has been est established to be uh, quite proportional to the intensity and as also the duration of the therapy. LDL is still the mainstay of the therapy targets among all the other ABOB uh, containing lipoprotein. However, this might change in the near future. In increase in the obesity and diabetes has also uh, caused a lot of interest in the other atherogenic dyslipidemias, especially the triglyceride-rich protein, lipoproteins, and hence the need to not, also, not only to check the LDL, but also the non-HDL cholesterol levels to improve the risk assessment. Uh, a new, uh, fairly recent, uh, exciting improvement is the elevated lipoprotein A uh, uh, proteins. It is very poorly detected, it's very expensive, it's not available in Kuwait yet, but there is a lot of research trying to target that uh, LPA. Now, if looking at the life course approach to reducing the atherosclerotic cardiovascular event, if you start treating patients around the age of 30 to 40, you could anticipate uh, presumably you could anticipate the percentage of reduction of cardiovascular event. 
And, and, and this will give us an understanding of the importance of the cumulative exposure to atherogenic lipoproteins to allow the global community to redesign the healthcare system uh, with different approaches. So starting at young ages with screening and primary prevention will, will is anticipated to translate into much lower uh, incidences over the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, looking at the different treatment strategies across different age ranges, once the patient get the, the cardiovascular event, it's almost, they're already seven or 10 years late in their management of, of, their, uh, of their hypercholesterolemia. Therefore, early intervention can prevent the greatest burden of cardiovascular event, and we should shift towards prevention and preservation of health rather than just treating uh, the patient when they present. For patients with advanced atherosclerotic cardiovascular event, the disease itself should be treated, but we should do so in a completely different way than those with minimal or the so-called primary prevention group. This is a very good example of estimating the benefit of initiating LDL cholesterol-lowering therapy at different ages and according to the intensi intensity of the therapy, whether late or early. If you look at the graph on the left side, if, if, you start, if, if, you, if you give the same intensity of th statin therapy at the age of 30 rather than the age of 50, you get almost doubling of the reduction of the cardiovascular event over the next 20 to 30 years. However, if you flip the coin and you give the moderate or low intensity statin therapy at the age of 30, if you compare that to giving a high intensity statin at the age of 50, you will get the same result. And this has huge implications for, in terms of the healthcare system design and also the cost. This is a trajectory of the course. It is estimated to be causing um, almost 25 trillion US dollar by the year 2050 to 2060. And uh, the, the, the roadmap for the cholesterol by the World Health Federation recommends that if they follow their guidelines, we could change that by reducing the cost if we go into the main uh, proactive approach of prevention and early treatment, especially that early treatment uh, very often in includes low intensity therapy and much cheaper drugs compared to the, the, the much expensive medications that we have to give when the patient present late. In terms of the recommended therapy, again, we all know about the awareness, population strategies, the risk assessment tools, and the digital solutions for data, this is all recommended. The main thing is the access to therapies. They divided countries to low income, moderate income, and high income, and suggested which therapies should be available. Obviously, we think of ourselves as in a high income uh, country, uh, so we should have access to high intensity statins, high intensity statins, a plus combination with azetamibe for patients who are not tolerant to statins, azetamibe, and pimbidoic acid, uh, a plus or minus uh, combination with azitamide. Pimbidoic acid is not available in Kuwait as of yet. The PCSK9 inhibitors are widely available, and the newly um, uh, introduced uh, injectable is the Inclisaran, uh, that is a twice yearly injection. It's not available as well in Kuwait. So, what's the expected LDL cholesterol reduction for combination therapies? If you go with the moderate intensity statin, you're looking for about 30%. If you go to the high intensity, you increase it to 50%. If you combine it with azitamide, you can get up to 65% reduction. PCSK9 inhibitors on their own can give you up to 60% reduction. And if you combine them with high intensity statin, you can get 75%. And if you give triple therapy, azitamide, high intensity statin, and PCSK9, you could achieve the maximum um, the maximum uh, hoped for reduction of 85%. This is a more detailed slide about, it's, it's very similar uh, percentages, but which ones of the statin to use. For statin intolerant, you're looking for 60 to 80%. For statin intolerant uh, patient, if you uh, utilize azitamide, bimbidoic acid, uh, and BCSK9 inhibitors, you're looking for anywhere between 35 to 60%. Looking at the targets, over the years, the target has been uh, decreased 
This is uh, very obvious if you look at the Canadian Cardiac Society guidelines for secondary prevention. They started with a target of less than 2.5 millimole per liter in 2003, reduced to less than 2.0. And in 2013, they introduced a high-risk patient group with a target of less than 1.8. And the latest uh, update was in 2021, they advocated additional treatment uh, to get an LDL. If the LDL is still above 1.8, despite high dose statin. Looking at the ESE guidelines, the 2021 guidelines is a very comprehensive, it's a huge paper that looked at all the cardiovascular risk factors, their prevention in clinical practice. Um, I will, so in terms of the prevention goal, it's very, very similar, we all know about it. Looking at the newly introduced score two and score two for old people, so you should look up first thing, look up your country, whether it's a high risk or a very high risk group. In Kuwait, it's a very high risk. And uh, you should adjust for the systolic blood pressure, the, the smoking, the gender, and then the non-HDL cholesterol. And they came up with recommendations. I will just go through the main ones, the class one recommendations. So patient with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, your target is less than 1.4. If you cannot achieve it with high intensity statin, you should always combine it with azetamide. If you still uh, cannot achieve that target with combination, they have a class A uh, recommendation to, uh, for a combination therapy, including a PCSK9 inhibitor. For type two diabetic at high risk, at very high risk, sorry, the, the, the target is again less than 1.4, and if they are only high risk, the target is less than 1.8. This is for the individuals who are apparently healthy, uh, an ultimate goal less than 1.4 or more than 50% reduction in apparently healthy persons less than 70 years of age, but who have a very high risk profile. So this is a very busy slide. I summarize it in the next here. Uh, when to consider statin treatment for primary prevention. Essentially, if you have a 40 years old patient without any known atherosclerotic cardiovascular event, if their LDL cholesterol more than 4.1, or if their non-HDL more or equal 4.5, if they have any evidence of calcium and then CT coronaries, they should be treated. And if they, are, if they have a lipoprotein little a uh, concentration of more than 100. So what's the benefit of reducing the LDL cholesterol? Does it translate to clinical event? So this has been studied extensively with a lot of very large meta-analysis, including hundreds of thousands of patients. And, uh, and, and the main message is that for every one millimole per liter reduction in the LDL cholesterol, you get almost 20% reduction in your cardiovascular event. Same graph here showing the same result, 22% risk, risk reduction. This is from the uh, cholesterol treatment trialist. Uh, for every one millimole reduction in the LDLC. So we have extremely dangerous disease, lots of risk factors, very high risk group patient, and also very effective therapies, but we still have major gaps in the treatment. So looking at the Da Vinci study, it did demonstrate that there is large gaps reaching the 2016, uh, uh, the 2016 targets uh, of about almost 50%. So only 50% reach their target. If you go to the 2020 to the 2019 goal, which is more strict, only 18% achieved their target. The main reasons for this is non-compliant of the patient. This is related to the um, uh, patient resistant or reluctant to take uh, high intensity statin, concerned about the related uh, adverse ev uh, events, the lack of healthcare uh, staff familiarity with the guidelines, and in addition to the high cost of the PCSK9 inhibitor uh, injectable therapy. Looking at the secondary prevention, so the target achievement is even worse. So for primary prevention, if you look at the CVS study in the Arabian Gulf countries, they found that 40% uh, of the primary prevention patient uh, achieved their target. Uh, if, if you go to the secondary prevention, 67% uh, did not achieve their target. So less than 40% uh, achieved their guideline directed target. If you look at the Dyslipidemia International Study, taking the Middle East uh, cohort of patients, this was published 2014. 
in the very high risk patient, only, uh, uh, only 30 percent achieved their target. So 70 percent did not achieve the LDL target. And in the very high, in the, sorry, in the high risk, it's 60 percent. So the patient who need it most are the patients who are not getting it or who are not getting the real benefit. Looking at the perceived side effects, the leading cause is the uh, mainly myopathy, which has been proven time and again that it's very similar to the placebo effect. If you look at the uh, primary prevention uh, group, the main, the main reason for not continuing on the statin was the, the perceived uh, thought that they, do, they no longer need the, the treatment. So, therapy interrupt, interruptions. So even with, if, 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 you, if you go to the injectable therapies that are twice weekly, you still get the same problem. 52% 50, of patients who are taking the PCSK9 have had interruptions of at least 30 days within the last year of their initiation of the PCSK9. So it's, it is an ongoing problem with the, with the oral tablets and also with the injectables. If you look at the total population as a whole, 44% had interruptions in all lipid lowering therapy by one year of initiating the PCSK9 inhibitor. So now we have the enclisiran, which has been studied. Sorry. You can just, you have one minute, huh? Okay, I'll, I'll just skip through. So the enclisiran, it's not available in Kuwait, it's highly effective. It has a sustained 45 to 50% reduction um, in terms of the primary efficacy result, it has been studied for up to four years. In terms of safety, it's very safe. It hasn't been shown to have any clinically relevant uh, adverse events. I'm going to skip this and go to the epic STEMI. This is a, a small study that advocated the routine use of high-intensity statin with routine uh, PCSK9 inhibitor for primary PCI. Uh, patient. So on the day of admission, they get it even before having the primary PCI, and they concluded that they got almost 70% reduction within one month in comparison to 50% if they are not in the PCSK9 inhibitor. I'm just going to go to the conclusion, take home messages. So cardiovascular disease, leading cause of mortality in the world. Risk stratify your patient, decide what's your target early on, and intensify your therapy. Don't forget lifestyle changes have regular follow-up visits. If the target is not achieved, always go with combination therapy. We have multiple modalities, the oral and the injectables, especially in very high-risk patients. Uh, the treatment is very effective, but we have a lot of gaps in reaching the targets. The lower is the better, but the earlier and longer gives you the best outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you.